Welcome back. That means pick up your mics there, mister. <laughs> Lenny, has, right. he can't do no more than but maybe get signs and throw at you I and stuff like that. Really. No, you weren't ready. Am I even but he, yeah, you're on. Ooh, yeah. Welcome back, welcome back, yeah, welcome back. We so last Wednesday, we, we were cut short. We would, did a little speed introduction to Psalms um, 8, and, uh, 19, and 29, which are the praise Psalms. Um, so we're going to really go back and dive into those today. We'll reread all three of them because I think we need to refresh them because they're really good psalms. They're very, really, very good psalms, actually. And then we'll... Out of the ones that we've done up to now, I think these are my favorite set. There you go. Go figure. You disliked (laughs) all of them up until now. (laughs) No, no, no. It's just like when we're listening to my playlist. She didn't say she disliked them. Skip. She Skip. said, this oh, is my favorite. <laughs> she didn't say she just liked them. She hit track eight. And I was trying to think, you know, why are, why are they my favorite? I think they're my favorite because they're, um, they're simple. They're simple, and they draw our attention back to the creator. Just very, very simple. Exactly. Okay. They're simple, and it draws your eyes back to who we should be praising to begin with. And it's just like the gospel. The gospel is very simple. When you overcomplicate it, you don't spread the message the right way. But the gospel is super simple, right? That's exactly what it is. So um, that's, our introduction is going to be pretty short and sweet today. Not, not, not the comedy hour here. <laughs> and so, uh, but we're going to dive into, we'll do, run through 8, 19, and 29 again. We'll read the scriptures and then do a little bit of an exegetical on 29 because we did 8 and 19. And then we'll dive into the theological and then the spiritual spiritual and practical applications of them. Which is kind of neat because 8 and 19, they kind of both have similar attributes. They take you back to the point of creation, right? There are songs that take you back to the point of creation. They pull imagery from the Torah. It's very, very obvious that this is very, very uh, Hebrew, Jewish inspired, right? But then you have like, the eight, it really talks about the terraforma, the creation on the land, whereas 19, it talked about the, the, the astronomy, the mm-hmm. astrological mm-hmm. aspects. Mm-hmm. And the writer used these imageries, not as a scientist or anything, but they used them to paint a deeper metaphoric picture that spoke to a deeper spiritual level right. than, you know, this is a science right. book, this is the way the stars work. no. Yeah, but if you notice when you read these, and if you go and listen to some of your praise and worship songs, what are they doing? Oh, they're playing. They're, well, they're even, playing. They're captivating the same thing. Secular songs mm-hmm. they play with language and use yep. metaphoric, hyper, mm-hmm. hyperbolic language. They use idioms, you know. Mm-hmm. But whenever it, because it's in the Bible, we'll say, "Well, oh, they totally meant this very literal sense." It's like, bro, this yeah. is a poem and a song. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> So let's do our laundry list of announcements coming up. All right. So, okay, first things first. Let's see what we today, Wednesday. So Heart to Table 316, um, Saturday. And we're doing uh, beef stew. We have all the food ready. We just need helping hands. Um, the venue has changed to the Gentry's house. So if anyone, hey, surprise. Hey, you didn't <laughs> know. Do? Now hey. you know. <laughs> so if anybody needs now, you, now you know to clean the day before because that's whenever I find out whenever I'm, we're doing it. <laughs> Put on the family calendar. He's like, he's like, I just heard in an announcer. She's like, I told you a week ago. She didn't. <laughs> she didn't. That's the Jedi <laughs> mind trick wives use. They never have really um, told so us. So, yes, if you need the address for that, you can reach out to one of us and we can get it for you. Um, next thing, we have the Easter egg hunt. That's going to be March 23rd from 1 to 4. We still need um, donations and help. And if you're members of Sam's, they actually have an Easter kit for 50 bucks. Like, it's got loads of candy and the plastic eggs in the bucket. You know how they had the bucket of s- Snickers? They have the Easter bucket. So how many of those are sitting by your recliner? <laughs> None yet. <laughs> None yet. <laughs> it's on the list. <laughs> and then if you're not part of uh, couples ministry, that is still going on. It's on Monday at 7 o'clock here at the church. Potluck. With potluck. And I heard last week was amazing, so you might want to join that. Um, then Calvary, we're having the uh, market on April 27th here at the church, and I believe that's at 10. And then we're going to do a prayer and praise night. It's the 13th of April. No, 12th. 12th of April, 12th which of was April. a Friday. Yeah, 
12th of April. Yeah, we're going to do a prayer and praise and maybe something else, but we don't know. It was just mentioned, but we don't know if that's going to go in something special. But Yeah, this is, good, this is going to be very, it's so charismatic that we don't even have a plan. Just show up. Yeah. We'll it's, turn into a prayer meeting. It'll turn into a tent revival. Who knows? But that's the whole idea of that. It's the focus is come here really on prayer. That's why it's prayer and praise because we're going to focus on prayer, prayer for the, for the, the church and the community around us, and then have praise in there because that's exactly what God wants us to do, pray and praise, right? So basically putting what we're studying into the shoe leather, right? And, and it's, gonna, it's not going to be up here, anybody up here leading it per se. We're going we're gonna to do videos with words. So we'll all be down here enjoying it and praying yeah, and praising. Yeah, it gives an opportunity for everyone to come and just worship yeah. and pray. Let go. Let go and let God, right? Yeah. So let's pray. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time and this opportunity to be together as a family and to worship you as our God. I pray that you guide the words and the lesson tonight, Lord. I pray that it plants a seed in the hearts of, of everybody within the sound of my voice, to include myself. May it bloom into a spiritual, um, a, a spiritual drive to seek your face, to learn about your word, and to better explore our relationship with you, Lord. I pray that 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 these that these psalms of praise that they be sung in our hearts and may that singing be a pleasing aroma to you i ask this all in your sweet precious name i pray amen and maranatha amen all right so let's read psalms 8 and then we'll read psalms 19 and psalms 29 so those are the three we are covering tonight we're going reading more consecutive okay so i will say remember the first two have that chiastic structure they have that where they kind of hoop out and in the very center of them that's your main points all right psalm 8 lord our lord how magnificent magnificent is your name throughout the earth you have covered the heavens with your majesty from the mouths of infants and nursing babes you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger when i observe our, your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you set in place what is a, a human being that you remember him a son of man that you look after him you made him little uh, you made him little less than god and crowned him with glory and honor you made him ruler over the works of your hands you put everything under his feet all the sheep and oxen as well as the animals in the wild the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. And remember, whenever we were covered, we covered it last week, that section from uh, 6, 7, and 8, it gives the account of creation, but in reverse. It talks about the, the sheep and the ox, and then it talks about the birds in the heaven, and then it talks about the fish in the sea. And remember, in the, in the creation narrative, it's, the fish, the birds, and then the beast, the land. And, and the reason why he says that in the chiastic structure and understanding that is because uh, Hebrew language is written different. They think different. And, yeah. and Damien's mentioned it before, and we'll say it again, is they, they, we think linear. We yes. think very, very one, two, three, four, five. Check, check, it, check, it, check. What we use, is, the way that we think and we see the world and the way that we perceive things, it's called ladder logic or linear logic. Even if you're the most chaotic, random, ADD person in the world, you have a very Western mind that's inspired by Greek philosophy and Western uh, concepts of language, right? So we understand things as everything escalates as it builds to. The more that we understand our, uh, a, a situation, it grows into more of an understanding. That, that's how we, we walk the ladder into a better understanding of it. Hebraic minds and Eastern thinking, it does not uh, function like that. It actually works on what's called block logic, where you take things that are thematically similar now, they might not necessarily actually be as similar to us, but in the culture, they have themes that run very, very deep. And the, the thinkers, as they write, as they um, interpret their world and they perceive their world, they lump things into groups, in thematic groups, and they understand their world in these pocket ideas 
that they're all kind of a web, but they're all thematic and separate in their own way, and they're assessed and analyzed in their own way. Not necessarily like we assess them as a constantly contained, growing right. oneness. You and, know? and the reason why I mention that is because a lot of times if you're reading the Bible and you get confused, is because of that. It's because of the way they think and they write and the way we think and we, yeah. we, we reinterpret things. And then we take our own, what we call presuppositions, what we've learned before in our past, and we add to that. That's why it's important to do an exegetical, which yeah. we'll do before we move on to the theological, is because it takes, and you need to learn and understand what the writer was doing first. Exactly. What was the writer saying? What, what was, who was the audience the writer was writing to? And what were they telling that audience? And then from there, after you learn that, then you can start, okay, now what was the re writer really trying to express? Yeah. And then from there, you can say, now how does that apply to us today? Exactly. And every, Bible's, every Bible book has four audiences, right? You have the audience of the story, the people that are being depicted, right? And that is, like, especially in narratives, they tell the story, right? And you have the individuals there. But the author of the story, nine times out of ten, probably wasn't even there in that story, and they're giving an account, and they're writing this account um, especially like in the Old Testament for prosperity prosperity and accounting of their history and their intended audience, it was for a purpose. So now you have two separate stories. You have the story uh, that's contained inside the book, but then you have the story of the book itself. And those two stories actually tell a complete story whenever you combine them because now the narration makes more sense on why they said things the way they said them. And and that helps you in turn understand what God's trying to say to you through his word. And that's why his word is so living. And this helps you, and we'll repeat this probably about 50,000 more times, but it's just, just to not get, tonight. Just, yeah, but it's just to get your mindset there and understand because after Easter, I'm going to announce it now, after Easter, our plan is to do a study in Daniel. We're going deep, y'all. So we ain't never be been a this deep, deep study, and that's actually a new study for me because I haven't actually studied the book of Daniel. Studied the book of Daniel. I've read, and I've I've looked at the different stories in Daniel, but I haven't actually dove in and studied like yeah. we have studied these things. So right? everybody so I know, everybody that's coming from like a New Testament uh, mindset, background, and things, everybody kind of gets really, really excited whenever we say, "Hey, we're going to do a Revelation study." Book of Daniel is literally a revelation study. So, and that's one of those that yep. gets really, really weird. And there's a lot of things that we're not going to be able to say without a shadow of yep. a doubt that this is the way it's going to be. Yep. Because we don't know. That would be our best guess. Yep. But we're going to give you our best guess and our best opinion. Yep. We may do this study again later on. And we've grown and refined our understanding of it, and so had, and so had you. That's why we call this the, the journey. journey. Right. Because we're right along with the you. Journey along with us. So, okay. Sorry about the sidebar, but I just want to get that out there. Because <laughs> we have some new faces out there, and I, wanna, I want them to understand the, the, the logic behind what we're doing here. Yeah, there. it's not all chaotic. It, <laughs> okay, yeah, it is chaotic, and we tried to make it sound like it's not. But, yeah, That's why bear with us. Here to keep it not Most chaotic. of us have taken our meds. Psalm 19. <laughs> all right. So the heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech, night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth, and the words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to their other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, 
Keep your servant from willful, willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And then Psalms 29. Well, so that one was the one that's also referred to by Spurgeon as the astronomer's psalm. And that one, you see a depiction of the heavens. Now, like I said last week, it is not a scientific depiction of the heavens. The author of Psalms was not a scientist, nor did he have modern understanding of aerospace or anything like that. He just knew that the object above him, from his perspective as being a land-dwelling human, moved above him. So he wrote in a hyperbolic language and with metaphor how it traveled from one point to the other above his head. So... You know, a lot of atheists would love to jump on this and crucify David for not understanding aerospace. And that that's your answer to that. <laughs> he wasn't in drama. He wouldn't have known. He was from the Bronze Age. All right, Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord above the vast water. The voice of the Lord is power. The voice of the Lord is splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the woodlands bare. In his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Amen. So I, let me ask a question here real quick. Go, Go for it. Do you know the reason why, if you read in the Psalms and you look in your, your, your book, Lord is all capitalized? You know? You know. Well, I you know, know clearly. Well, tell us. Well, because... No, no it's an on. important. It's actually well, important. So there's Well, a hold on, because my, my computer just died. So either it's because Lord is the, tr the translation for Yahweh. Yahweh. And then the other one uh, would, would be Elohim, Elohim, which is the name. It was right. just a nicer way of... A, of it was a nicer way of addressing uh, God without addressing God. Like Hebrews and Jewish culture... They did not God. want to use the name of God. And even today, if you ever have Jewish friends and they're writing something to you and they have to use the word God referring to Jehovah, they will put G capital dash D. And that's it. You will not get a true Jewish person to write the O in there. You would have to threaten the yep. hurt them or yep. something. Yep. They won't. You know, that's just, it's dis. Um, it's just... Uh, it's using, using a name. The name using of the, the name in vain. Use the name of the Lord. So these names, like Yahweh is actually an abbreviation, and nobody really knows what the vowel sounds are. Our guess is Yahweh, mm -hmm. but that's a guess. Mm -hmm. And then Elohim is the name. Yep. So the name. it's not really saying... It's saying without saying. Yeah. And, and that's just how they... English interpretation has broken down the different names of God. Yahweh, Elohim... Pretty much. And for anybody that are, and for you especially, I know, Jehovah is a Latinization, Jehovah's of Latinization. Yahweh. He doesn't like Jehovah. I do oh, not. See, he doesn't like the word Jehovah, Jehovah, I should say. I don't say he doesn't like Jehovah. Oh, because, like because Jehovah. it's a Latinization of a word that we already have, and it's like it just makes confusion. Well, Jehovah's like there's a German a great one too. Let's throw that one in. Why not? Sure, why not? That gets in a whole other debate. For another I, time. I digress. So, so anyway, let's say <laughs> we like to spin them up every once in a while. Yeah. I poke. <laughs> you know what? I spun myself up because <laughs> you, you weren't gonna go there, and you I did. went there, and you I did. got what you I did. got. All right. So let's look at an exegetical outline of Psalms 8, 19, and 29. So an exegetical outline is basically it's a look at the scripture for what it is. Right? There's not putting any interpretations to it, any twist into it, I mean, any presuppositions that we know into it. This is just looking for what it says, and we're interpreting it and figuring out 
the context of it. Yeah, right? we have a bad habit whenever we read the Bible that we read it like Baptists, Pentecostals, Catholics, uh, non-denominational. We read it with our denomination and we interpret it from our denomination. Well, almost every single one of those denominations didn't exist at the time that this was written. So the framework of those thoughts they're, those frameworks were inspired by this, but they're not necessarily the best interpretation of them yeah. because you know, that's the cart putting. Yeah. That's a cart horse thing here. <laughs> and, and, and this does take practice. It's it's hard. It's very hard to do. And you'll never really actually 100% do it because none of us are a Bronze Century Hebrew. None right. of us are even Jewish. Uh, so there's like a huge, we already are at a cultural re reference yeah. deficit. Yeah. Well, well, and I think that's the, <clears throat> that's the benefit of practicing the exegetical outbreak is that we take away the suppositions because with those suppositions, we limit God's word. Yeah. So if we can train our minds to look at it exegeti ex exegetically, exegetical. yeah. as we grow and mm -hmm. study, it'll mm -hmm. just get stronger and stronger, yeah. the, right. the breakout. I'm, I'm just sharing. I do this for me. I'm just sharing with you. <laughs> no, no. I, I would also say, me. whenever you're reading, though, also with, with Psalms, and this is a good practice, too, because we've all had various different people tell us how a thing is interpreted. Yeah. But test the interpretation out on yourself as yes. well, because a lot of the things that we read, a lot of these are checkpoints on what do you actually believe. And whenever you're reading through the Bible, do you believe this literally or do you believe this metaphorically? And that's been a debate for Christian thinking for 2,000 years, longer for Jewish thinking for 5,000 years. Is it being literal, literal, or is it being metaphoric? Now, whenever we're talking about Psalms, a lot of this is metaphoric, hyperbolic language. But whenever we're talking about Genesis, there's poetry in Genesis but then there's historical, right. uh, it's a combination of a document. Mm -hmm. And that's whenever you start really have to like read it, then interpret it, uh, you interpret it literally. Right. Then you read it again, and then you interpret it as metaphorically as you can. Right. Research what uh, idioms existed in that time, what were turns of phrases, and you will find whole new layers of the scripture because you're reading it that way. When you do that too, you'll you'll find your mind just explode every time you turn around. It's like pow, 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 what, what? And then God reveals more and more to you. And then as you start studying him, seeking him more and more in the word, he reveals more and more to you with that way. Yeah, so because very a, there's, there's a lot of times where the answer lies right in the middle. That's a lot of these things are literal and, and metaphoric. Yeah, literal and uh, so Psalms, <laughs> Psalms 8 uh, we look at human dignity under a divine majesty. So you see in verse 1, you see introduction and invocation, right? So, and, and you have a, the outline in the handout, um, if you have the handout. Um, so the Psalms opens with the declaration of God's majesty across the earth and heaven setting the tone for the worship and awe. Then it goes into verse 2 and 4, and this is where you're going to see that chiastic structure. So it goes into verse 2 and 4, is it the paradox of the human sacrifice? So the psalmist marvels of how God, despite his vastness, cares for and remembers humans, emphasizing the seeming insignificant yet honored position of humanity and creation. And going back to that chiastic structure in Hebrew thinking, where we see the blocking and the dead center of that, is that parallel of why do you like God? Why do you like humans? And oh yeah, you lifted humans just below God. Mm -hmm. Very similar to Joseph, he was lifted up just mm -hmm. below uh, Pharaoh. Yep. Interesting, right? Yeah. Very. But I mean, that's that dead center of that structure. So, reading it with the Hebraic kind of concept, that's the main idea. That's the thesis statement. It's in the middle. And that's the, 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 the point that David's trying to drive home. The main thing is we're in this weird position that we probably don't belong in, mm -hmm. but God has put us there. Mm -hmm. We have the right, we have an obligation, in the position that right. we're given. And then do you see that in 5.8? It's our, our role in honor, right? So in 5 and 8, this section reflects on the honor God has given humanity just below the divine, with stewardship over creation, highlighting the dignity and responsibility bestowed upon humans. If you ever want to know your worth, there's your worth right there. If you ever doubt how worthy you are, 
That's your worth right there. You've been set just below the divine. You were created in the Imago Dei, in God's image. You are worthy. And we are still naming creatures to today. Oh, yeah. Right? So you are worthy of him. Right? So that's your worth right there. Right there in Psalms. Right there in the middle of Psalms, chapter 8, shows you who you're worth. Right? So if you ever doubt yourself, just go read Psalms 8 and remind yourself, yeah. I'm worthy. And I'm I, so worthy that he's put me right below him. Yeah, and I think it's interesting um, that the conclusion of that, of that song it's not just a physical, but it's a spiritual obligation. It's a dance mm -hmm. between the two. The mm -hmm. humans have this obligation mm -hmm. to both the both the creation and the divine. Yep. That we're we're kind of I hate to say on the hook, but we're kind of on the hook between the two. That right. we we are a spiritual animal that lives between the two yep. worlds. Yep. yep. The framing the human dignity within the context of divine glory. And exactly. Right. One of the things that really set us apart from the animals, not communication or being able to use tools, but we're the moral animal that it has a concept of spirit. Yep. Yep. And then moving over to Psalms 19, it's the revelation of God in creation and the law. So you see at the beginning, one through six, it's God's glory in his creation. So the first half describes the humans declaring God's glory and the skies proclaiming his handiwork, showing the natural world and the testaments of God's creative power. Then you see in 7-11 the perfection of God's law. Here's that chiastic, and here's that importance. Remember, the chiastic, it goes here, and then it starts coming out here, and then what's in the center is the most important part, and then it comes back and closes it up, right? So the perfection of God's law, transitioning from general revelation to special revelation, the section... It extols the virtue of God's law as perfect, righteous, and more desirable than gold, providing wisdom and joy to follower. So, meaning, because of the grace of God and the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, we have the ability, when we come to know him, our desire becomes to obey his law. We don't change because of the law. We change because of our desire to seek him and glorify him and be part of him. It's, well, Pastor talked about it this past Sunday about, he's been talking about two, two Sundays in, in the garden, right? Biting of the good and evil, taking a bite of the fruit, and, you know, and then you see the blame game and all that stuff. And uh, what happened is, is now we're separated from God. So the reason why we a lot of times are circling around in the world not knowing our position in life is because we're missing something. And we're missing God. That's what we're missing. We have that hole in our heart. And that hole in our heart is the, the Holy Spirit is not dwelling amongst us. He's not in us because when he was in, come down, when they would walk in the midday, God would come down and walk with Adam and Eve, right, in the garden. Well, when they sinned and he exiled them from the garden, they no longer had the presence of God among them, right? We didn't, as sinners in the world, we don't have the presence of God among us. When we accept Christ because of Christ dying on the cross, the Holy Spirit is imparted into us. Now the presence of God is among you. So that yeah. fills that hole, that fills that loss, that, and, that, uh, that, that darkness that's there. Now I do want to say something on that because I've been there. I've been there. Um, yes, a non-believer is searching and searching and searching because they're looking, they're looking for God, right? They're looking for that peace that he gives. They're, they're looking for him, that salvation. However, believers can feel the same way. And it's, a, and it's it's God calling you into communion, calling you into relationship, into studying and, and learning more about him. He wants to grow with us. It's not you're saved and you're done. Right. You no. Know, and that, that too often we see, saved right. and done, then you sit on the pew and yep. look sour for the rest of your life. Say it. <laughs> like say it. Then lemon drop. That's yep. not what it is. And I did want to draw attention, too, to uh, verses on 19, verses 7 through 11. That is all the law right? Yep. That's, that's part of his law right there. But yet when we read it, when we hear the word law, a lot of the times we think negative. No, you can't live up to the law. You can't, you can't live up to it. You're, you're right. But when he says it from 7 to 11, 
it sounds so sweet that you want to do it. Yeah. Because you love him, you want to do these things. Well, you know, it's funny that whenever I was going to synagogue and I was hanging out with the Messianic Jews, now those are Jews that believe in Jesus and they worship Jesus like we do, mm -hmm. but they don't identify as Christian. They maintain their Jewish identity. And that's very important to them. But they are our brothers in arms. They're just the Jewish side of the same coin. And whenever we would sit there and we would discuss um, adherence and obligations to the law, they always were confused why we saw God's word as such a hefty obligation. And granted, they're keeping the law way more fervent than we are because they had a cultural obligation, whereas we don't have the cultural tie-in to a lot of the Mosaic law that they do. We, we actually follow the law as per Acts 15. There's something some, for you guys to look up. So our version of the law is a very simple approach. Acts 15 again, look it up. And that's how we adhere to the law. And they're like, well, we don't understand why you, you guys see it as, as such a burden. We get joy from it. We get joy from it. We're following the guidance mm -hmm. and the wisdom of our Father. He gave us these things. Even down to the talits that dangle from the edge of my blouse that I'm supposed to keep on here, I see it as God separating me from the rest of you. And he set me aside and made me special. And he gave me this instruction to do. And I do it because I love him. And he gave me this because he wanted me to be separate. So I'm not seeing the heavy weight that you guys see. Right, to be righteous. So yeah. <laughs> with that ending right there, I do want to read it again because it's good. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. So not only do we see the, um, the benefit we, not only do we see the law, but we see the benefit. Like there's a doing this, you become this. And it's... Um, it's an index anxiety. So it, your heart desire changes. Right. And your heart desire changes because the Holy Spirit's back in you, right? That's, that's where that is. And that doesn't mean it's like it changes overnight. It takes time. That's right. part of, that's part of uh, um, sanctification. Yeah. And if right? Jesus is a good... If Jesus is a good doctor... And the law is the prescription, the medicine that would cure the problem, not necessarily the problem of sin. Jesus cured that problem, but the problem of how do I live a good life that's honorable and glorifying to you? How do I live a good life that I'm a good citizen walking in your kingdom? Because being saved has nothing to do with being good or being bad. Why do good people go to hell? Why do bad people go to heaven? It's we all about that the last couple of songs. It's all about their alignment. And granted, those bad people, well, they might be having a lot of intense conversations because they might not have been going where they thought they were going. And those good people, well, they might have lived a very righteous life, but unfortunately, they never aligned themselves with the creator of the world and they kept themselves as an enemy of God mm -hmm. because they never changed their citizenship. Right. We're citizens. If you're a good citizen in the kingdom, you follow the kingdom's laws. The kingdom's laws are located in the front of the book. Very easy. However, there's a subsection, if you're a Gentile not born under the Hebraic bloodline, for the mm -hmm. Goyim or Gentiles like us, mm -hmm. and that's located again in Acts 15. There you go. You heard it, a, a, what, how many times now? Five? Three, now, I want to drop this before we move on. Drop for, it like it's hot. For, <laughs> first Peter 5, through, or 15 through 16. But as the one who called you is holy... You also are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. And what does that mean, to be holy? Set apart. That is all about living a set-apart, separate life. How do we do that? Talits on our garments? Well, that's not necessarily in Acts 15 for us to follow. Uh, not eating pork? Well, pork, wasn't really pork and shellfish weren't really covered for us, so, you know, bring on the BLTs. It's not one of our obligations. New, 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 new moons or Sabbaths? Well, here we are again. 
But following his law and following his Meaning, precepts. start off with loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Yeah. Loving your neighbor as yourself. That's your start. How, are, how much are you going to stand out in this society today if you're doing just those two things? You're going to be holy just doing the bare minimum. And then as you go along by doing those two laws, as you go along, you start seeking God more. And then he reveals the things that you follow. And then you'll find yourself following along many laws without even realizing you've changed and followed along those laws. Well, that's because that became your natural programming now. It's like whenever we were covering James, your language now is Bible. You speak Bible. Bible is now your, in your heart so much that Scripture is your way of communicating. So whenever that's your way of communicating, that's how I live my life, and that's how I pray. My prayer is now I was going to say, I was just going to bring that up, is like, I've noticed in myself, and I've definitely noticed in you lately, and I've noticed in Cindy, as we have been praying more, Scripture has been more flowing in our prayers, because that's what God wants. That's how your thinking is. That's where God is bringing you. He wants you to speak His words. And we... Now, now, I do want to, I'm not going to man, mention any names because, you know. Please don't. But um, with that, about, you know, as we're, as we're studying and as we're diving into God's word and seeking people to grow with, um, that's the importance of doing what God has called you to do. Right. Because you never know who's watching that's going to pick up how you pray, mm -hmm. how, you, how you worship, how you live your life. We are edifying one another by our walk. Yeah. And we have to keep that in mind. It's not a selfish okay. salvation. But it's for all of us. Right. We need each other. Right. And that's the important part of, of 12 through 14. It's a prayer of guidance and purity. So it closes off in, in Psalms 19. It closes it off with a, a personal prayer for cleansing from hidden faults, mm -hmm. avoidance of sin, and acceptability of the psalmist's words and, and thoughts before God, linking obedience to God's law with true worship. Mm -hmm. Obeying God's law is a truest form of worship that you could ever do. And again, it goes back to understanding words and how they are. We think, I mean, before we started diving down into any of our studies, I just thought worship was just coming on Sunday morning and singing and praising, and that's worship, right? No. Worship is everything you do, right? And the truest form of worship is following and obeying His will, His, his law. Which is why we read the Shema every close. I, I was about to say, the beginning of the Shema really tells you what avenues you're supposed to be living your life for God. And if, whenever we go through it later, just think of the list there. There's not too many avenues that aren't in that gear of living towards God. That pretty much encompasses just about everything, down to your muchness. Yes. And we'll explain what the Shema is at the end before we read it because there's new faces. So, and in Psalms 29, it's the voice of God in creation. So we see the call to worship. Now, this uh, psalm is not in a chiastic form. It's, no. So it doesn't do the boom, 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 boom. It so is a is, strophe. It's, now, you got to Google that because I have to Google it. My computer died, and I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> but that's the word. It's trophy, right? Everybody has a smartphone in their hand. Right. So, Google and, it. and this is something that you, when you really seek God and dive in and learn, you, you find yourself learning more language and history and, and things of that nature. So any history buffs, dive into God's word because you're going to get some really good history. But... Um, you see here on 29, it's the voice of God in creation. So it's the call to worship. The Psalms begins with the summons to the heavenly body uh, and begins to ascribe glory to the strength of the Lord, emphasizing the holiness of God's name. And then you see the power of God's voice at 3 through 9. It's the central section. Vividly describes God's voice thundering over natural elements, waters, forests, and causing cosmic phenomena, portraying God's sovereignty and power manifest in its creation, right? And then God's reign and blessing in 10 and 11. The Psalms conclude by affirming God's e uh, eternal reign over floodwaters and his strengths and peace bestowed upon his people, encapsulating the themes and divine kingship of benevolence. So you see how it's broken out, almost an outline of what it is, and you're kind of grouping it to what it needs to follow and not putting anything in it and we put some extra stuff in there because it just pops in our head and as we're teaching along. But when you're, you go down, the first thing you should do when you go study a book or study a chapter is do an exegetical for it. Read it for what it is. Don't think about what, it, what it's going to say to you or what God's trying to say to you. Just read for what the writer has wrote 
in the audience. Now, I, I would also add for your first couple of reads, especially mm -hmm. Old Testament, mainly Old Testament. We as yeah. Christians have this very, it's, uh, it's not a bad habit. No. It's just a bad habit if it's the only tool you use, right? So we have this bad habit of only using this tool whenever we read Old Testament books is we play Where's Waldo, but we play the game Where's Jesus. And we go through the entire thing really looking for Jesus. And while we're looking for Jesus, we're missing so much of the actual fun. And it's not the fact that you shouldn't find Jesus because he's totally there. It's just that shouldn't be the very first thing that you look. You read the book for like, what was its original intent, its original authors, what was the context? Then you go and play Where's yeah. Jesus? And I was gonna point here, so mostly if you get your analog Bible, just about every one of them, now it's mostly your study Bibles. Right at the beginning, most of your authors of your study Bibles will have a little bit of section in there, and in that section they'll give you a quick author, who the author of the book is, a uh, historical background, right, and then the message and purpose of the book, or whatever it is, and then whatever else they deem is necessary to understand in that book. Which, that can that open can up a, a lot. whole lot of interesting uh, internet searches whenever you start diving yeah. into how they know who wrote what and when it was written. A lot of those pages are their best guess and what, you know, the 2,000 years of tr Christian tradition have concluded. Yeah. But, you know, we're still learning things every day. Yeah, absolutely. So theologically, let's look at Psalms 8, 19, and 29. So Psalms 8, theological, the theological uh, reflections on humanity's place in creation. So it's the divine majesty and the human dignity. Psalms 8 marvels at God's creation and the special place humans occupy within it. It's very important to understand that, and we just talked about that a little bit. And, and theolo theologically, it affirms the imago Dei, which is really big. I, don't, I, I can't stress the importance of understanding the imago Dei. And the imago Dei is the Latin word basically for God, image of God. Yeah. Right. I think another thing that it also it also stresses as the the true blessing of our position in the world, like mm -hmm. a modern cultural interpretation of us humans being in charge of things is usually kind of negative, especially from a Western point of view. We're as humans seen as kind of a plague that's destroying the planet, and we're the worst thing that's ever happened, and that's kind of this anti-human, anti, um, yeah, anti-human position yeah. that our culture has taken, but this is the opposite of that. This is saying that we're even though even though we're fallen, broken, and sinful, and this is written well after the fall of man, we're still this beautiful creature in this position because God said so, and we're still even after the fall in this position still just below God. Interesting, whenever you think about it, because if you go from a very Calvinist interpretation, that, that shouldn't be, because we're all just the worst creatures that ever existed. Yet here you see a balance between, are we sinful? Absolutely. Are we beautiful to God and ascended to a high level in the eye of the Creator? The answer is yes as well. Yes. And the author of Psalms will say, it's, it's a marvel because he couldn't understand mm -hmm. it either. Right. It's, it's a paradox of human insignificance in the vast cosmos against the backdrop of a divine care and intentionally. He's intentionally caring for us, right? So this psalm right here it, it is a theology of stewardship where uh, we as humans, are seen as caretakers of God's creation. Very important. I think and that, that's, that's that thing we got to pull from this, that psalm, is to understand where we are. And again, it goes back to that Imago Dei, that Imago Dei, we're in the image of God, right? God cares for us. Therefore, we should care for others and other creatures. Yeah, and if you pay, charge to it. Yeah, and if you look at some of the laws for caring for animals, they're very specific and did not exist in other cultures at all. 
the Hebrew law set in the, that we find in the Bible was very unique that it had provisions for animals. Very interesting if you really unpack that. He's, God had put us in this position to be these stewards of, of creation. And like I said, a cultural, our current cultural view of that is like humans are the worst thing that ever happened to this planet. And the lesser of them, the better the planet. But God's answer in this, in this Psalms is not so much lesser people, but people that have a better understanding of who they are in existence, their responsibility, and then taking it seriously as if they are right. second to God. Right, exactly. And that stewardship falls into what we know and we've learned is called sadaka, right? Your muchness, what you need to do. Our charitable things, our, our muchness, our goodness, this, this is what God wants us to do is to pour it out. We, we, don't, we don't just fast from something. When we fast, we should be doing our sadaka on top of it. We should be doing something. So st we're stewards to do something. We should be giving something as well. Yeah. A, a righteous living is a life of charity, not the recipient of it, but the giver of it right. in some capacity. Right. Whenever we're talking about the greatest commands being love God and love your neighbor, that loving your neighbor is that active verb aspect of sadaka righteousness that's the pouring forward yep. and helping with yep. needs helping those who can't help themselves and being that person even being that person to correct somebody whenever they're wrong right. having the uncomfortable conversations whenever you know it's going to have right. a bad right. repercussion that's an act of yep. mercy and love too yep. because you're putting your relationship on the line as a sacrificial love because I want to help this person right. because my heart breaks for them. Right. And we know that about is Sadaka. Lately. And we know about heartbreaking lately. <laughs> breaking for the lost, right? So looking at Psalms 19, God's revelation of creation and the law. And so it presents a theology of revelation through both creation, that's the general revelation, and through the Torah, which is the special revelation, right? And the heavens declare God's glory without words, while the law speaks directly to the heart and mind of humans. Guiding, warning, and rewarding. That's the important part of the law, because it's a guide. It's, it's a, a warning. It's, uh, it's, it's speaking, a reward. And it's speaking directly to your heart. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that we can act out, because then we'd be hypocrites. Because right. hypocrite means... Actor. An, actor. an actor. So as we're as we're studying God's law and we're trying to apply it the best we can to our life, it's going to change your heart, not what you're wearing. Right. And and that law is that perfect and desirable. So the psalmist elevates the Torah, which is the law, portraying it as a perfect, trustworthy, and more desirable than gold. I mean, I could use some gold. Now, keep in mind, desire some gold. John 1 says the word of God, God became flesh, flesh and was Jesus. Yes. So this very Torah law concept that's greater than gold literally is the manifestation mm -hmm. of, our, mm -hmm. of our Savior. Yep. Yep. So, so it articulates a theological understanding of God's commandments as not burdensome. It's not a, it's not a heavy burden, but life-giving and joyous leading to fuller, more harmonious existence. And again, the burden comes from the perception. Like yeah. my friends that, and my friends that still at Brit Hadashah, the synagogue, they don't find it as a burden. They find the love in well, it. Well, I mean, even take us, for example. I, I don't find many things in the law a burden anymore. I, I look at it, I don't read it, I don't have that negative impact in me anymore. When I read it, I was like, oh, okay, well... If God's correcting me, I, I feel the, the heaviness. I feel a heaviness mm -hmm. and a conviction in my heart if I'm yeah. doing something wrong. So then I correct it. I don't yeah. let it sit and linger anymore. I correct it. That's the key word that you use, though, the negative, because yeah. you still do feel the weight. Yes. You still feel that weight that you, you're going to feel the sacrifice, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it's not negative. It's not a mm -hmm. negative outlook mm -hmm. that, like, oh, I'm doing that. You know, I can't believe it's not, it's mm -hmm. not like that. Right. And then now, and then you take joy in following his commandments, following his law, right? So then let's look at 29. It's a sovereignty of God demonstrate, demonstrated through creation. So the divine kingship and power, Psalms 29, uses the imagery of storm to predict God's power and sovereignty over creation. And theologically, it speaks to God's trans, uh, transcendence and uh, eminence. His power is beyond human comprehension,
yeah. yet he is actively involved in the world. That's the key, and that's what you got to remind yourself. We always try to put God in a box. We can never begin to understand the power of God. Yeah, the concept of transcendence means that God exists outside of this reality. That the concept of form, time, space, they're, they're things that he created, so he's not subjected to them. Why would he be subjected to the things that he created? Now, when you said that, put in perspective now, Satan, on the other hand, was created, and he is subjected to those things. So Satan is not omnipotent, omnipowerful. He's not everything. He has many minions and can be many places, but he is not everywhere, and he doesn't know everything. Yeah, his scope of percep perception is far wider of a yeah. scope than ours because he's been doing it for he, many years. And many he, years. Exists, he exists in the spiritual and the physical, right. knowing without a shadow of a doubt what the spiritual is and we don't have that we so, know what the physical is because we live in the very physical and we're and we're leaning on the bible as the authority of our spiritual so that putting that in perspective put the the devil where he belongs and that is powerless in your life yeah especially put god to where he belongs and that is powerful in your life that's the importance that's the importance of understanding who the creator is and who the creation is Right, because when you start understanding who the Creator is, then you start putting your faith in the Creator, and when you put your faith in the Creator, you get the confidence to do the things you need to do. You get the peace that goes beyond all understanding. You get, you see where it's going. You, you can you can get through those valleys because we're gonna go through those valleys, no matter what. We're gonna get the world is gonna th throw what the world has at us, right? Yeah. But the difference is, is your eyes are gonna be on Him. Your heart's going to be following him and desiring after him, God. And because of that, he's going to be there with you in the midst of that valley and help you through that valley. Because everything we do is a learning and growing experience in our life, right? It's to sanctify us, to, to get us to a point to where when we one day get our glorified body, we're able to judge angels. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for a, for a verse to um, hang on to, you're going through whatever you're going through, you're, you feel like you're beaten up. Um, Psalms 29, 11, the Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. And that's just been something that since we've been studying this has been just one of those anchor mm -hmm. verses. Yep. That, and that's it. And he gives us the voice of the Lord. You see it in there in 29 and then the peace of blessing, right? So let's look at some applications here before we close up. Where can we apply these, these spiritual, these psalms to our lives? And what do we got to recognize, right? So in Psalm, <laughs> reckon, you better recognize. Uh, <laughs> psalms 8, so human dignity and divine majesty. We got to recognize our value and responsibility. Going and back. I, and, and I, I hit on that big time because, you know, it, it, and the reason why I hit on that big time is because billions and billions of dollars are spent on self-help books. Yeah. Right? And what are self-help books? They're books to help yourself. Yeah. Somebody, man, telling you how to help yourself. Well, and technically, <laughs> it's not really self-help because right. it's really getting it's somebody help else from the telling guy. You how to do it. The guy wrote it, so it's just help. Right. When God's given you instructions right here, when you seek him and you understand where you are, again, understand that Imago Dei. When you understand you are created in the image of God, and you're given a position right below him, right? He's given you that power of who you are in his kingdom, that citizenship. And you understand that. Now you can have the ability and confidence to get through whatever you need to do. Well, and, and unlike those self <laughs> sorry. <laughs> er, no. But unlike those self-help help books, they're not just words in the page. We have the Holy Spirit that teaches us these things. It's a li he's a living he's a, God. He's, yes. he's working through us no matter what we're going through with his word. Right. Yeah. Well, now I forgot what I was going to say. That's why I went er no. Yeah, no, right? I know. You just stopped me. <laughs> it's probably, it was probably a rabbit trail anyway. Wow. <laughs> so, so well, wait for it. I'm going to say, oh, yeah, now I remember. Yeah, exactly. Hold on. Just wait. Uh, so so that, uh, that's why I'm very big on that Imago Day and understanding your self-worth. Oh, yeah, Who you are. And how important you are to God. Because when you can anchor on that, mm -hmm. it carries you through a lot of things. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Please go. So, 
Um, one of the one of the the classic trappings that we have with a lot of traditional Christian thinking is, especially from the Protestant school, Baptist school, and things like that, we seem to hard and heavy focus on the absolute corrupted, fallen, evil nature of man, right? And we really hard focus on there's nothing you can ever do that will ever be right. You're just, everything that you ever do is just going to be filthy rags. So, and I think whenever we hard focus just on that concept, which is only one side of that understanding of what is man, it's easy not to have that view of the Amagu Day. It's hard to see the beauty of humanity. It's hard to see us as that position of second to God. Right. Because that is very, very true. But again, going back to we're created in the nature in the in the image of God. We are a creation that was seen by God's eye as good. Yeah. And there is a beauty to humanity that exists at the exact same time as its wickedness and evilness. We are much like God. We live in this paradox of being both wretchedly evil and a beautiful creation, much like God is transcendent and imminent, where he's completely everywhere, right. not here, right. and very close by. So, so practically what that looks like is we need to basically engage in some things that just demonstrate stewardship. We living, live your, your faith out loud, basically, right? So you got to understand your value. Understand your value is right below God. So understand what God's value is and who God is and who he is. And by understanding who he is, now you're going to honor him and you're going to honor him with what you do by stewardship and by, by praising him and by worshiping him and, and things of that nature, right? Yeah. Joseph's only boss was the boss. Our right. only boss is the boss. Carry on smartly. Right. And, and that makes the point of, of, of understanding and affirming of who you're, you're worth. You're worthy. You're worthy of his, of his grace, love, and mercy, right? So therefore, we should be worthy to put it out to everybody else. Give that grace, love, and mercy. And going back to the original concept of grace and mercy, those were some of the earliest forms of money. That existed as money before money. Then in 19, we see the revelation of God and creation of the law. So seek God in natural and revealed knowledge. Psalms 19 teaches that God reveals himself in creation and his word. You won't get to know God without getting into God's word. It always goes back to God's word. Yeah. Right? So you got to commit regularly to spending time in, in, in God's nature. Just, well, I was doing that today. The past two days have been beautiful. I've been sitting outside and enjoying the weather. Like, it's just been amazing. And then studying God's word. And then when you take God's word out and study his word in nature, oh, it's even better. Right? But, uh, <laughs> well, that's just, that's just putting peanut butter in your chocolate <laughs> exactly. shit. Exactly. I know. So, so, and you got to just seek, seek encountering God, right? You got to seek encountering God. So, and you can encounter God anywhere. You can encounter God driving to work, praising him on your drive to work or listening to his word on the drive to work. Because the Bible is on audio, so play it through your, your the scriptures while you're driving around. You're stuck in traffic instead of getting mad at the guy cutting you off. Why don't you just focus on God's word, right? That's and the mercy. Isn't that interesting as we focus on God's word? We'll get the value. Exactly. You'll get the value. You'll definitely get the value of it. Or the, not, we won't get the, we're already valued, but we'll get the concept right. of value. Oh, I got you. So, and then embrace God's law with a joyful guidance. So, as we talked about, look, God's law is not a negative. It's not something to keep the man down or oppress you or whatever it is. It's, it's actually a joyous thing. It's something that keeps you upright and become an upst upstanding citizen in the kingdom of God. Yeah, think of them, think of them as Joyce. God's guidelines. And whenever you read the verse that says Jesus fulfilled the law, know that in that fulfillment, meaning he kept it, he set a role model, an example. So him by keeping it, especially in that cultural concept of how they kept, used the word keeping, uh, and fulfilling, he fulfilled the perfect example. So we're supposed to 
walk as, as he walked. walked. Yes. You hadn't said that in a while, by it's the way. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. But I figured I'd bring it. I thought you forgot John all of First all John, I thought you chapter <laughs> 2, verse 6. <laughs> I thought you forgot first John. I was for teeing it up. It took me a while. Yeah. I just don't, you know, you got to pull him out of the vault every now and then. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, if, if we're following Christ and Christ fulfilled the law and he followed the law, the best of the ability and it, it, with the idea of having that relationship mm -hmm. with God, well, then that's what we're supposed to be doing. Right. I, can we make it any simpler? Mm -mm. I don't think we can. But then you look at Psalms 29 and the voice of God in creation. So listen for God's voice in life's storms. There you go. Psalms 29 portrays it goes back to the beginning, understanding who you are and God. And when you go and when you're in those valleys and you know who you are and your worth in God, now listen for God's voice as a powerful and majestic even in the chaos of the storm or like Elijah, when he's listening for God's voice, it's in the whisper of the wind. Isn't it interesting that even 8, 19, and 29, we have it sandwiched? Mm -hmm. Because the beginning, we're talking about that value. How are you going to get the value? By knowing his word. Right. The voice of God in the storms, how are you going to know the voice of God in his word? So it's kind of sandwiched right in the middle. That's, that's the mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. in just these psalms, mm -hmm. his word. Mm -hmm. That you, goes back to that chiastic structure. The, I mean, if anything, you can understand your worth in God. So that's the biggest thing. So let's see. As we're closing up here. Um, we're circling. <laughs> so key insights from, the, from tonight, God's majesty and sovereignty, the glory of creation, humanity's unique role, and the revelation of God through the law. So we got to live those out. We got to... Um, We've got to take the challenges that we have and understand where we stand and who we are in God, right? And then the only way you're going to know him, like Cindy said, is in his word. And when you're in his word, you start to follow his law. And when you start to follow his law, you start to praise him more. When you start to worship, that's a true form of worship. When you start to worship him, guess what? Now you start seeing the blessings that he's already laid in front of you and you never saw before because your focus was on the world and not on him. And your blessings are all around. They're all around, right? So next Wednesday, we will be doing Psalms 32 and Psalms 34 for individual psalms, and then Psalms 38 and Psalms 40 for lament. Right? The lament or Basic, a it's, communal? Basically, it's, it, they're communal and lament, communal lament. And uh, yeah. it's basically, it's just tying it up, because this will finish our first book of Psalms study. And then the Wednesday before Easter, we're actually going to do an Easter study. We have a, a psalm that we're going to bring out and show you where it links to It's Christ. not in the first book either, no, so this is going to be completely off of the, <laughs> the, the path that we have been on. Right. So random psalm, right. but it's going to be relative. And, right. and, then, oh, I'm sorry, and then we're going to do that, and then we'll have afterwards, we're going to dive into Daniel. And then we're going to take a break from psalms, and then we'll come back. The next Psalms we'll do, we'll do the Psalms book too. So for Daniel, you have to have your tinfoil hats, <laughs> oh my <goodness>. your <laughs> ham radios, yep. your fatigues. <laughs> yeah, right and we're going to gonna talk about the end of the world. <laughs> end of the world time. The end of the world time, man. Okay, it's Shema time. The <laughs> <laughs> Shema is Deuteronomy. Sherry's like, I have half the stuff in my car. Sherry was like, that, get him. No. <laughs> All right, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. All right. So we're going to do a little something special, just like what we had mentioned Prayer with Scripture. I'm going to do the uh, Aaron's benediction before we set you guys loose. That is found in number 6, 24 and 26. It's a very special prayer that Aaron gives to the people of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The, may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen and Maranatha. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you in the funny pages.